You look really ready. Okay, I am. I might have you draw the state, okay? That's what I'm gonna have you do. I can't draw. Just do your best. There's no right answer. That's pretty good, actually. You won't be graded. No one's gonna criticize you. Yeah, you're off the grid now. No. Or trash talk okay. you. Or make you nervous while you're drawing, Georgia. <laughs> and don't worry, you, you're just gonna be judged by millions of people. Yeah, yeah, no big deal. We take the shapes of our states for granted. What few people realize is that the map of America could look very different. Maine could look like this, or this. And now it looks like Maine, pretty much, like a chicken burger. <laughs> Georgia could be sitting pretty on the Tennessee River, and Nevada might have been left high and dry. What do they all have in common? Water. In this show, we take a little road trip here. Yeah, I'm like Johnny Cash for cable TV. I just walked the line. It's the history hidden in our map, how the states got their shapes. In this episode, a river runs through it. Oh, water literally shapes our states with our oceans, rivers and lakes forming most of our borders. In fact, every state but four has some water on its border. But water is not just a line. about 2,000. On the Tennessee side, Patrick's looks like a typical neighborhood watering hole. Can I ask a, to, to get a draft of beer over yes, there? Yes, you may. Well, thank you very much. Except a few bars have a state line running right down their middle. And so, coexistence has been something you've done forever. Forever. Right? As far as you yeah. know, you've always, these states have all kind of gotten together. <laughs> and coexisted peacefully together. It's all been one community. Yes. Okay. More or less. Yes. Sure, everyone gets along now, but everything could change if they find out there's a big mistake in the map. <laughs> Surveyor Bart Craddy and his team are in Tennessee or at least everyone thinks they are. Now, Bart, you and your team of surveyors are out here on the, the Tennessee-Georgia line. Not actually, this is presumably. a 30th. Presumably. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Well, what is this actually? This is a 35th parallel latitude north of uh, the equator. Now, why is that significant, the 35th parallel? That goes way on back in history. Uh... Okay, here's what happened. In 1796, Congress created Tennessee from North Carolina. Its border with Georgia was supposed to follow the 35th parallel. So the Tennessee-Georgia line should go here. So the, the equipment that the original surveyors were using to draw the Tennessee-Georgia border was inferior, broken, in a not the right equipment? What, what was it? Probably all the above, to be honest with you. <laughs> now, I've never thought about it that way, but yeah, probably all the above. Bart wrote an article pointing out that today's border isn't where it was supposed to be, the 35th parallel. And this quiet little Tennessee suburb is okay, right okay, on that line. Down. So the 35th parallel is the real border. The border is off about a mile. Great. Technically, the people on this street even over here, they think that they're living in Tennessee, but they are actually in Georgia. Well, they're below the 35th parallel latitude, but they aren't in Georgia. Okay, <laughs> I like this. This is becoming a game of semantics, and I'm, 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 now, I'm now I'm in. What are we gonna do? So what, 
Today, BART can trace the 35th parallel, the intended border, to within a centimeter with modern GPS equipment. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if we draw the line from this point, it, it, is it going, where, where's the line going? Oh, through the, right, through through, right through that house's living room. Right through mm -hmm. that house. Okay, well, I should probably tell her that half of her house is in Georgia, the other half of it is in Tennessee. How do you think she's going to take the news? Hi, I don't mean to interrupt you. I just wanted to ask you a quick question. <laughs> Did they tell you about this dilemma the street finds itself in? Yeah. We just learned that, that the real true border between Georgia and Tennessee, um, it kind of goes right through your living room. Oh, really? Hi, how are you this morning? You just became a resident of another state. I, I, I almost became a resident of Georgia. You did? Well, yeah. now you are. That puts your house in a very unique position, in a way, because you, you're sort of a resident of two states. How about that? The weather's going to be about the same, though. No change as in it the is. weather. No, this, the weather is pretty much going to be the same as it is across the street. You know what yeah. you could say to your friends? You own a vacation home in Georgia, but you live in Tennessee. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, my. Georgia lost something even more valuable than this house when the border was incorrectly drawn. Follow the 35th parallel, and like a treasure map, it leads you to the region's most precious resource, water. I'm surrounded by water right now on both sides of me. Water that Georgia would love to get its hands on. Now, check this out. According to the car's GPS, I'm at 34 degrees, 59 minutes, and 38 seconds north of the equator. So, technically, this whole area should have been in Georgia. When the map was incorrectly drawn, Tennessee got an extra 51 square miles of territory. And now, Georgia wants it back. How serious are the Georgians? In a word, very. Nine times, Georgia has asked for the border to be corrected since 1890. So far, Tennessee has turned a deaf ear. Lake Nickajack is in Tennessee, but barely. The Georgia line, pretty much at that fence. Do you think there is a reasonable claim here to move this to the original 35th parallel? Without question. The border has been fine the way it is for over 100 years. Why don't you just leave it the way it is? When you think about the region and the growth of the southeast and the fact that, you know, we need water in North Georgia as badly as anybody does, that's what this is about. That's code for Atlanta needs Because Atlanta was built on solid bedrock, all this rain runs off into creeks and storm drains. So now, Georgians want to tap into Lake Nickajack, just yards over the border. To back up their claim, lawyer Brad Carver has come armed with a club, a golf club. Now this will demonstrate what exactly? Brad has been making speeches on this issue. Mm -hmm. 
and he talks about the fact that the state line is within chip shot of the water. Quite, quite literally. Quite literally. And, and just so that we're, we're being exact here, that is a University of Georgia Bulldog golf club it, uh, ball? It is a golf ball from the University of Georgia. And, okay. And it's to let them know that uh, Georgia is uh, placing its... By golly, you made it. It actually is it with did. that chip, chip shot of, of... That's fantastic. You can see the ring out there. Yeah, I can. Nice work. Thank you. Um, Very good. Very happy about that. Well, at least you know this. If this border dispute doesn't get settled, you'll have one heck of a nice golf course here. That's right. <laughs> From its start, Tennessee was all about water. When Congress cut Tennessee from North Carolina, they had their eyes on one crucial body of water, the Mississippi River. In our rush westward, it didn't matter at the time if all the lines were exactly right. Borders, political borders, can be established with not a whole lot of care or concern if there's nobody there. And that's usually when the border's established. OK, nobody's there, we'll just draw the line, and nobody really cares. Then people show up, and they start to care where the border is. But once the border is written on a map, it's very difficult to move it. Why? Can't we just take a piece of Tennessee and give it to Georgia? Well, changing a border isn't that easy. It requires an act of Congress or the Supreme Court. And the most important thing to them is how it will affect the tens of thousands of people who live and drink along the border. Straddling the line, Patrick's Bar is in Tennessee, while the kitchens and bathrooms are in a dry county in Georgia. It's party in front and business in back. Well, I just used the can in Georgia, and now I'm going to continue legally having a beer in Tennessee. If Georgia gets its way and its water rights, this town, Copper Hill, Tennessee, will suddenly find itself in a new state and in a dry county. So ironically, this bar might find itself serving only water. And that might just be the last straw. Where, where you're sitting right now would be in another state, technically. And you would also be in a dry county. You wouldn't be able to drink here if the laws of that county were enforced here. Does that scare you at all? Oh, sure. That's, that's very taxing, Georgia. <laughs> Trying to get our water. Now, do you think living and in take our beer? Oh, take your beer. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. They can have the water as long as they'll leave the beer. You're okay with that? You're okay with that. You're okay. So, a bar fight over water. Your old mistake. It all goes back to the shape of Tennessee and the 51 square miles that. Wherever there's a lot of springs, I think they have pretty good drinking water. Yeah, so up in Maine. Yeah. Which of these states has the most miles of shoreline? Is it A, Texas, B, California, C, Florida, or D, Massachusetts? Which of these states has the most miles of shoreline? The answer is C, Florida. While Georgia is waging a border war to get at Tennessee's water, one state has more water than it can handle. Maine. The state is practically drowning in the stuff. In fact, Maine got its shape from water, frozen water. States don't only get their shapes from the boundaries on a map. In the case of Maine, it also owes its shape to the glaciers that carved out 
its landscape. There are close to 6,000 lakes in Maine, and there's at least as much water underground. If Georgia is a sieve, glaciers turned Maine into a watery sponge. How? It takes a geologist to explain. So, Bob, you are, you are leading a host to water. Pretty good, huh? Beautiful. God. Yeah. When I look out here, Bob, I see a really beautiful, picturesque lake. Yep. When you look at this, explain geologically what, we're, what, well, what you see. This basin, and you can see there's another basin out there with another lake in it. These, these were all scoured by glaciers. We had at the maximum glacial extent probably at least 5,000, maybe 10,000 feet of ice right here. And then the glaciers, they, they didn't just scour. In other places, they left behind thick deposits of sand and gravel and mud and, and uh, other materials. And in those places, that's where groundwater can accumulate in those great uh, sand and gravel deposits. This is more or less what Maine looked like before the glaciers. They carved the lakes, rounded the mountains, and sculpted Maine's craggy coastline. That's how the state got part of its unique shape and its water riches. So, how much water are we talking about here, Bob? <laughs> how much water yeah. are we standing on top of yeah. exactly well, here uh, in Maine? Yeah, Maine, we get on average 42 inches of rain a year. That's not the most of any state, but it's, it's right up there. And uh, so that, uh, that comes to, if we want to talk about gallons, 24 trillion gallons of precipitation, rain and snow every year. Now, does that, that count for what's underneath the ground? Well. Um, that's just, uh, and, and out of that 24, maybe somewhere between two and five trillion gallons goes down and replenishes the groundwater. Let's say the water were oil. Where would Maine be in that sort of comparative uh, sort of analysis? A lot of people like to say the Saudi Arabia of water. But, you know, I got kind of tired of that, <laughs> that analogy. Why would you bit. get tired of that as, as a U.S. <laughs> geologist? <laughs> well, because, because water is renewable and oil and gas are not. You know, like Texans are to oil, the folks in Napa Valley are to wine, Idahoans are to potatoes, Mainers are to water. God, you're unequivocal yeah. about this. Yeah. You, this is the place to be right here for water. That's right. <laughs> it's the best water in the world. But is Maine's water really the best? There's one way to find out. I've got three waters here from three different states. OK. And since we're talking about water, we wanted to see if people could identify where the water is from, or at least pick out the one they like the best. It shouldn't hurt you. <laughs> Yeah, no, uh, it shouldn't hurt you. Do I have choices of states? 50. Oh, often. OK. What do you think of that? It was fine. Just fine? Yeah. I don't know, it tastes a little um, metallic a little, maybe. Metallic? Not a good aftertaste. OK. Kind of tastes like uh, metallic a little bit. OK. Maybe they didn't clean the pipes out. <laughs> this is a good one. OK. <laughs> They taste a little bit different, but it tastes fine, too. That's not main water. Tastes a little know. sugary. Yeah. Sugary? Yeah. This tastes more familiar. OK. That might be main. OK. That's the best of the three. And you like it the most? Yeah. yeah. Wow. It's amazing. Seriously, because like everybody picks the main water. There's a geological reason Maine's water is so good. It all goes back to the glaciers. When the ice sheets receded, they left behind massive piles of gravel, mud, and sand. Today, when rain hits the ground, it runs through these mounds and resurfaces naturally filtered. So what's down here? There's a big spring coming right out of this glacial sand and gravel we're walking on right here. OK. And Could I drink from that if you... I were to put my hands down there in that yep. water? Yep, you could, because okay. that's really good groundwater coming right out. It's not been in contact with the atmosphere for some time. 
Well, what is growing down there on the top well, of that? Well, actually, all that green is watercress. Oh, really? It's uh, one of those aquatic plants, just yeah. loves this stuff. I'm going into this area to experience something that I only read about. I didn't know you could actually do this, but where you could actually find a spring, stick your hand in it, and drink from it. And, and, uh, and I dip my hand in the water and I take a drink out of it, and I really do expect to be poisoned. <laughs> That's delicious. And it's nice and cold. Great stuff. I think I, I drank something, maybe like a, a leech or something. Oh. <laughs> There's none of them here, right? I don't think so. Okay, good. Might have been a mosquito, maybe. They're, they're just proteins. I do feel a little tickle. Yeah. feel a little tickle in my throat. So glaciers gave Maine its jagged coast and turned the land into a giant water filter. But more than frozen water formed this state. What's the longest river in the U.S.? Is it A, the Mississippi, B, the Missouri, C, the Colorado, or D, the Tennessee. What's the longest river in the U.S.? The answer is B, the Missouri River at 2,540 miles. Here's a question about water and the American map. When it rains in the lower 48 states, where does all the water eventually go? You're from Canada, right? Yes. Do you drink water up in Canada? Yes. Okay. Coincidentally, the folks in the United States drink water too. And when you throw water out or when it rains, it tends to drain into specific regions okay. or areas, ultimately. Where in the end does water sort of drain? Nearly all rainwater in the lower 48 states drains into one of just three places. At the end of the day, though, in the very end, I might go back to the ocean, to Atlantic. To so you're ocean. so out here then. There's the Atlantic. No problem. No problem. Drain this way. You think it would go this way? The Pacific. I, I want to say this way, but it seems like it's okay. too easy. And rainwater has a third destination. This one in the vast American interior. So if if water falls on this region of the country, uh -huh. and we're in uh, what state are we in again? Utah. I sometimes, you know what? I don't remember. That's okay. Um, where does the water go when it rains? Where does it flow? Oh, it's a tough question. Well, that's a tough question. The answer is very, very near to you. We're near us right now. Um, I don't know. Um, and I think it's that way. Is it the Provo Lake? No, no. I think it's that way. Salt Lake. Yes. The Great Salt Lake. Okay. That's correct. That makes sense. This third destination is a huge region between the Sierra Nevadas and the Rockies, called the Great Basin. With a lack of fresh water, it seems like a place to avoid, but it's the heart of where the Mormons settled and tried to carve out the state of Deseret. Here, water has nowhere to go, except through evaporation, leaving behind minerals and salts. The result, the Great Salt Lake. Its salinity can be three to eight times higher than the oceans and much too salty to drink. While water makes a one-way trip to the Great Basin, back in water-rich Maine, it takes a far different journey. Here in Maine, they've got so much clean, pure water, they're actually bottling it up and shipping it to other states. So how did Maine manage to turn its wealth of water into a booming business? Well, it all started with a bellyache. In 1844, Hiram Ricker was an ordinary Maine innkeeper suffering from indigestion until he drank from a spring on his property. His indigestion cleared up, and an idea took hold. Could he sell this water around the world? 
It may sound crazy, but in the mid-19th century, most water wasn't clean and often carried disease. Hiram Ricker's first customers bought the water as a cure for whatever ailed them. This was the 1800s when they were selling water, and if you drank clean water, you got better. Mm -hmm. um, for real? For real. Because there was so much contaminated water or impurities in water. There were impurities in water. Today, Poland Spring turns out 69 bottles every second. And that's just a drop in the bucket. Americans drink 24 million gallons of bottled water every day. In contrast, the Ricker's first bottling plant was a modest affair. And whatever happened to Hiram's original spring? The Ricker's enshrined it. Here in this chapel built as an homage to the original source of Poland Spring water, and here behind plate glass, being protected by that mannequin over there, is the original source that Hiram Rickard found some, I don't know, more than 150 years ago. Let's go inside and actually get closer to it if we can. We have to keep our voices down because this place feels almost like it's a, a religious place. And here, So if, if, I, if I ask you to describe the shape of Maine, what would it look like? Like a chicken burger. Like a chicken burger? Like a chicken burger. Can you draw? Oh, yeah. I can't draw. You can't draw? <laughs> no. OK. Just, just use that as your whole canvas. We got this thing here. Yeah. And we got a little funky stuff over here. Right. And that looks like Maine, pretty much, like a chicken burger. <laughs> I, don't, I don't see the chicken or the burger. Where is Only it? Only we a chicken burger compared to you. Yeah, we. <laughs> Neither chicken nor burger, Maine was originally part of Massachusetts. It became a state in 1820 to counterbalance the admission of slaveholding Missouri. The border between Maine and Canada was supposed to have been settled by treaty at the end of the Revolutionary War. But for decades, both sides argued over how to interpret this treaty. The treaty seems quite clear. It says it follows the highlands that separate those waters that go to the Atlantic, that would be Maine, from those waters that separate, uh, that go to the St. Lawrence. Put a little boat on the water and watch it float, and you can see where the line is. The US claimed this was the border while this is where Canada felt the border should be. It led to a long, drawn-out debate about what rivers flowed where and even what constitutes the Atlantic. The solution? Meet more or less halfway. So this is how glaciers and compromise over water created Maine's strange shape. 
Maine has more water than it can handle. But out west, states are on the verge of a water war. Why? Because of their shapes. What state has the least average rainfall? Is it A, Nevada, B, Arizona, C, New Mexico, or D, Alaska? Which state has the least average rainfall? The answer is A, Nevada. When you follow the lines on our map, you can see how past decisions affect how we live today. Because of the map, Georgia is trying to change its border with Tennessee, and Maine has one of the strangest shapes in the Union. Why? Water. And there's one region where water may actually shape the future. The American Southwest. Everything west of about the 100th meridian is arid country, it's desert. And unless it is modified by human activity, it's essentially uninhabitable, at least uninhabitable in any large scale. And so if you want to get a lot of people in a place like Las Vegas, you somehow have to command enough water to get people there. Water is the critical thing. Nevada embodies how water shaped the Western states. Its largest city is Las Vegas. With two million residents, it consumes 255 million gallons of water every day. I'm only a few miles outside Las Vegas, and it's plainly obvious that this is not an ideal place to build a gigantic city. It's the driest state in the United States, and this is the Mojave Desert. So where does Las Vegas get its water from? I don't know. I don't know either. <laughs> and I would say it's imported by truck. <laughs> Ooh, I know, um, Lake Mead. Correct. Lake Mead, the country's largest reservoir. The Hoover Dam blocks the Colorado River and forms Lake Mead. It's all a wonder of engineering, but things don't look so wonderful right now. That bathtub ring means one thing. Water levels are dropping. So the depletion of the water supply that comes from the Colorado River is pretty evident. The white line, the demarcation you see on the mountains here, is really an alkaline marker or a line that shows you where the water once was. And that water line drops down more than 100 feet and has done so since the 1990s. So where is all the water going? Well, the Colorado River is used by seven states. It's the nation's driest region, so each state has staked its claim to the water. Now, the growth of western cities is sucking the river dry. What states do you think are most adversely affected by the drop in the Colorado River? What they're talking about right now is Arizona and Nevada are going to have a pretty big impact on the uh, water conservation. Okay. Uh, Nevada, Arizona, California. California uses the most out of this whole system. California uses the most out of the whole system. Right, right. About 4.5 million acre feet go to them. We store water for California. That's one of the big reasons why they built this dam. This is store water for Southern California. Why does California have a claim on the river? Well, the map holds all the answers. Uh, when California became a state, when it, when it created its own boundaries, they were primarily these straight line boundaries that were keeping these mountains in California for the gold, but they also had a concern about water. That eastern boundary of California, a nice straight line, and then it squiggles. That squiggle that goes down to the Gulf of California is the Colorado River. For 80 years, the river was just a line on the map. But starting in the 1930s, California began draining off the Colorado. They turned desert into farmland, now producing almost 80% of America's winter vegetables. 
So how much water does California take from the Colorado? 1.5 trillion gallons. More than is consumed by Seattle, Las Vegas, St. Louis, Minneapolis, Chicago, New Orleans, Miami, Washington, D.C., Philadelphia, and New York City combined. Or more than enough to cover all of than anyone else today. So where does that leave Nevada? I happen to think that Las Vegas is a ghost city in the making. What state uses the highest percentage of hydroelectric power? Is it A, California, B, Oregon, C, Mississippi, or D, Idaho? What state uses the highest percentage of hydroelectric power? The answer is D, Idaho, with 78%. The American Southwest. Colorado River. Seven states draw from it, and we're now taking out more than is going in. The clearest sign of dropping water levels is at Lake Mead. Now, my GPS says that I'm about a quarter mile out into the water here on the rapidly receding shoreline of Lake Mead. And I know that I'm definitely not underwater or on the water. So I think my GPS is confused. One thing that's not confusing is how valuable water has become. In the West, you know, water is um, better than gold. Gail Kaiser's family has owned the Lake Mead Marina since 1957. And it's been a struggle just to stay afloat. I guess I want to ask you how business has changed um, for, for people who operate boats on Lake Mead in the past couple of years? Well, in the past couple of years, in the last, since 2002, has changed drastically. 2002, we moved the marina 12 miles down the lake because where we were is, dry, is all dry land now. Since 1990, Lake Mead's shoreline has receded over 800 feet. In fact, where we're standing right now, at one time, we would, was, this was underwater. Oh, yeah. We'd be yes. standing underwater in what year? Um, here, probably 2004. If trends continue, Las Vegas's two intake pipes could end up above water. What would be the result? <laughs> war of the raw water. If war. Water, war, water wars? <laughs> water wars. What would happen if the water really does run out? I happen to think that Las Vegas is a ghost city in the making. If not for the water that's pumped in, if not for the electricity that keeps buildings cool, it would be the small desert town it was 100 years ago. Is there any way to save Vegas? Do I need to shorten my showers when I'm staying Shower here? with a friend. Shower with a friend. Yeah, that's the answer. Okay. Group showers. Group showers, yeah. then. And if that's not enough, do you know how to do a rain dance? I do. You do? Yeah, What's actually, it look like? It's, a, it's pretty simple. You have to think real hard. Yeah. Snow, Western, Rockies. Snow, Western, Rockies. Snow, Western, Rockies. Okay. Snow, Western, Rockies. Snow, Western, Rockies. Snow, Western, Rockies. Am I moving okay? You're doing, you're doing good. No. <laughs> oh, good job. Wait a minute. I just felt a drop. I really did. Oh, I yeah, I told you it was written. It's working. It's working. It's working. Nevada may feel like the wronged party in this water war, but the state wasn't even meant to be on the river in the first place. 
In the 1850s, Congress created the Nevada Territory, carving it from Utah. Congress handed over more land when Nevada became a state in 1864. But there was one thing Nevada lacked, a water supply. That whole triangle at the bottom of Nevada had been part of what was then the Arizona Territory, since it was just territory, Congress could still take it. And it gave Nevada, among other things, access to a piece of the Colorado River. Why did Congress take Arizona's land and give it to Nevada? Well, because Arizona had sided with the South during the Civil War. It was payback time. Nevada got access to the Colorado River, but Arizona may get the last laugh if this water source dries up. Water holds all the answers in Nevada, even how the state got its shape. Nevada is only on the Colorado River because Arizona picked the wrong side in the Civil War and then saw that river become a lake to water California's vegetables. This just shows how fluid our borders can be. These blue squiggles and dots on our map, America's waterways. Where they are tells the story of why Georgia wants Tennessee's water. How Maine came to look like this. And why Nevada is on the Colorado River. Read between these blue lines and you discover how America came to be and who we are today.